Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we thank you today for inviting us into your house of worship and prayer. We now invoke and invite your presence to tabernacle with us in a mighty way. Move in this room today that somebody here would declare as we leave this place, surely we have been with Jesus and it has been good to have been here. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Good morning. I have a couple of church life announcements for you this morning. The first and most important is uh, I want to direct your attention to the Christmas Candlelight Concert. That's tonight at 6 p.m. The uh, musicians uh, here, you see the bells, you see the voices, you see the pipes, and we'll be adding strings and brass to that. So this has been a gift that is especially prepared for us. All we need to do is come here and be here at 6 p.m. tonight to receive that gift. And it's the, the best that we can offer you uh, for this holiday season. So please be there. I want to make sure that everyone feels uh, invited to this program in the warmest possible way. So my hope and prayer is that you be able to attend that at 6 p.m. this evening. Uh, I also want to direct your attention to, we have some uh, uh, copies of Tim Jennings' book. Uh, if you remember, Tim Jennings was our guest speaker a few weeks ago, and his book, The God-Shaped uh, Heart, uh, and the, the Remedy, which is a paraphrase of the New Testament for devotional purposes, uh, we have copies of those available. Uh, so uh, those are at the hostess desk. If you're looking for a uh, Christmas gift for this season, that's one opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. And I also want to invite Larissa up here now, and I want her to help me introduce her. So Larissa, you were busy with a mission project, and that was uh, uh, the hurricane in Houston, the relief effort. In Har help with the Hurricane Harvey in Houston back in November. Um, when we arrived, the students divided into five or six groups, and each group was taken to a different location to help with different needs that families needed. Uh, we were sent out to paint, dust, break down walls, put drywall in, and make, make some boxes of food for the families that were affected. And every time we arrived, we would ask the families to pray with them, and we would pray and they seemed so happy and glad that we were there to help them. It was very difficult to see the families as they had struggled through so much, but we really wanted to show God's love in the work that we did. So um, everyone there was very loving and it, was hard, it wasn't hard to feel God's presence all around us. Um, of the work that we did, we felt we did so much, but it was only a fraction of everything that happened. We were glad to help the with the problems that we did. Um, I'm glad to say that we were able to help those families because we were as much of a blessing to them as they were to us. I know that lots of help came from this church and we wanted to thank you for your support and ask you to continue to pray for the victims of the hurricanes and all the tragedies that are happening all around us. Thank you. Hi. I see a lot of red. You guys are looking great and Christmassy. Let's see if we have a few more. So my story today starts with a teacher that had a science project for her students. And she showed them this. I'm going to show you. Let's see if somebody can tell me what these are. Granola? No, not granola. Any other guess? Seeds. Seeds. Yes, they're seeds. So the teacher said, okay, this is our project. Everybody's going to go home with a pot and a seed and some soil. And this is going to be a long project for the next two months. You have to take care of your plant. You're going to put soil, you're going to put the seed, you're going to water it two times a day in the morning and then at night, and two times a week you're going to take it outside and put it in the sun. Too much sun can kill it and no, no, uh, if it has no sun, your plant can't live either. So the students all went home excited with their project and all of them started working on it right away. So, one of them, a few days have passed and said, oh no, 
It's been three days and I forgot to water my plant. So he went over and he flooded the plant. He's like, I hope that works. And then another one said, oh no, I left my plant in the sun for five days. He said, okay, I'll bring it back inside. I hope that's okay. But there was a little boy, his name was Johnny. And Johnny remembered every single instruction. The water in the morning, the water in the evening, the sun two times a week. He did everything perfect. And now it was the day before the project was due, and the kids were at recess talking. And they were like, hey, how's your plant looking? They're like, I don't have one. Mine never came out of the dirt. It's just dirt. And they were like, oh, no. He says, I, I don't have one either, said the other kids. And they all talked. Nobody had a plant in their pot. So Johnny said, okay, maybe I'm not the only one that did it wrong. The next day, when the kids get to school, and teacher said, it's time to show us, show me your project. Grace comes over and says, this is my plant. And Johnny was like, what? You said you didn't have a plant yesterday. He didn't say that, but he thought that. So Grace brought her plant. And teacher said, hmm, that's very nice. Then, Matthew said, this is my plant. And Johnny thought again, what? <laughs> you said you didn't have a plant yesterday. And teacher said, Matt, that is very nice too. Another student said, this is my plant. And Johnny started to tear up because he said, I am the only one with an empty pot and I'm gonna be in trouble, and I'm gonna get a bad grade. So he was tearing up, and the teacher came over and said, Johnny, is that your plant? Johnny said, yes. And the teacher said, I wanna tell everybody that Johnny's plant is the perfect one. The kids were all looking at each other, and the teacher said, our lesson for today was not about growing plants. It was about being honest, because those were not seeds. They were plastic seeds. Nothing was ever going to grow out of them. I wanted to test you and see if you would tell me the truth. <laughs> so now, this is the part that is also for the parents. Sometimes we don't want our kids to fail as parents. And we'll go and we'll say, hey, let's go buy a plant. You will just say that you grew it. So, now, do you guys think that's kind of lying? Yeah, that, that's kind of being a little tricky and not telling the truth. And sometimes telling the truth is hard. And sometimes we have to pay the consequences of telling the truth. Sometimes we might get a bad grade or sometimes we might get in trouble. But that's the right thing to do. So today, Pastor Peter is going to talk about someone that felt like he was being tricked and lied to and it doesn't feel nice. Okay, that's the end of our story for today. There's no children's worship, so go back to your parents. Goodbye. This time I'd like to invite the deacons to come forward to collect the offering. And I would encourage each of you to give as liberally and generously as you feel blessed to give. Today's offering is for the church budget. And I'd ask that the deacons would now collect the offering.
Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning and are so grateful and thankful for all that you have done in our lives. How you've blessed us with the things we need, how you're working in our lives to restore us to the image of the people you created us to be. We thank you for this offering. We ask that you would bless it to finish the work of spreading the gospel, the good news about you in this world. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I would like to invite all those who have a special prayer request to come forward through the front at this time as we sing hymn number 671.
you are able, please kneel for prayer. Almighty God, as we celebrate the birth of your Son once more, we are confronted with a wonder so great it is beyond our ability to comprehend. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Thank you for giving us the clearest and ultimate revelation of who you are, the divine made human, embraceable, vulnerable, and even killable. We connect Christmas with family gifts, colored lights, and evergreens, but we settle for so little. Forgive us for being caught up in the sentimental value of Christmas while our hearts are hijacked from the inexhaustible riches in Jesus. Keep us ever mindful of your faithful, measureless, unconditional, transforming love. I lift up to you all who have come forward, some just wanting to thank you in a special way, others are wrestling with life's challenges. Thank you for meeting each one's need with a wonderful counselor who experienced it all and shared in our humanity in every way. You understand us and know everything about us. Thank you for the assurance that before we call, you hear and will answer according to your divine will. Thank you for the Prince of Peace. Wars kill, prejudice prevails, divisions abound, nature unleashes its fury. We ask for peace within and without, in our hearts and throughout the earth. You spoke peace amid thunder and a raging storm and from a whirlwind, and ultimately you guaranteed our peace by means of a violent crucifixion. We give you our gratitude adoration, praise, and worship. Break into our lives anew and awaken us now to your message through Pastor Peter. I pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to follow the scripture reading on the screen. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce, divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She gave birth to a son, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Sweet little Jesus boy, born in a manger, sweet little holy child, 
We didn't know who you were long time ago. You were born, born in a manger, Lord, sweet little Jesus boy. Didn't know that you'd come to save us, Lord to take our sins away. Our eyes were blind. We couldn't see. We didn't know who you were. Sweet little Jesus, Boy, born in a manger, sweet little holy child, we didn't know who you What a wonderful message and song. Sweet little Jesus. Boy, we didn't know who you were. Wasn't that a beautiful number? I just love that song. Just want to say that on behalf of my wife and, and I, we want to just say thank you to all of you who've been so gracious and kind and generous as we welcomed our little baby Jasmine into the world on December the 5th and we are just so thankful to have her and she is here today so some of you who want to see her you may be able to see her we're just so glad to be here with you here at the Vallejo Drive Church also want to mention that my brother-in-law my wife's brother is here today visiting with us uh, to help us out with the baby and all of that he's all the way from Guyana so I don't know, is he somewhere here in the congregation? Uh, there he is, way in the back. Uh, Christopher, glad to have you here with us today. We are indeed very thankful and happy to be able to, to be here. This is our, what, now my, my fourth month here, and I'm just so blessed. This is a wonderful church for us to have uh, children in and we're just so thankful for all of you we had our son dedicated here um, and now we have a, a baby girl coming into the world and I'm excited to be your family pastor and as family pastor we have to produce children but I do declare <laughs> I do declare I think we're done amen amen my father said if you get a boy and a girl you've got a millionaire's family and uh, I may not have the, the money to prove it, but I feel like a million dollars. Amen, somebody. Amen. Today, I want to just invite you to share with me the message of this scripture and of this song that was just sung so powerfully and beautifully. Uh, I've captured that message and entitled it, Not Your Baby. Not Your Baby. I invite you to just turn to your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, oh neighbor, it's not your baby. Come on, come on, tell them, tell them. Oh, they, they sound like they don't believe you. Just go on and turn to your other neighbor and tell them, neighbor, oh neighbor, it's not your baby. Uh-huh. That's right, it's not your baby. I can't even imagine Joseph's pain when Mary said those words. Honey, I'm pregnant, but it's not your baby. About nine months ago, my wife came to me and said, Honey, I'm pregnant, 
but it is your baby. Oh, yes, yeah, she said it. It is your baby. <laughs> Just last week on December 5th, when my baby Jasmine came into the world, I gave her my name and I, I claimed her as my own. Because she was my baby. Somebody said, what a, what a beautiful baby girl you have there. And, and I said, I automatically took credit. I said, of course, she's my baby. And I lay claim to her and acknowledge her as my child. I held her in my arms and I said, daddy's baby girl. In fact, all of us should hold our children in our arms like I hold my Jesse and my Jasmine and claim them. My son, Jesse. My daughter, Jasmine, you ought to give them your name and teach them your morals and share your values and love them and protect them and provide for them and take full responsibility for them and claim them as your own flesh and blood. That's the right, honorable, respectable thing to do. But here the writer of Matthew records this puzzling message from the angel. Mary will have a child. You go on and marry Mary, Joseph. Protect her and that child. And care for her and that child. And raise that child and love that child. But always remember, it's not your baby. It's the child of the Holy Ghost. I don't know exactly how Mary broke the news to Joseph, but it, it sounds like drama to me. Doesn't it just sound like drama to you? Ma Mary's most likely story was, honey, I'm pregnant, but the baby is not yours. Well, how'd you get pregnant, Mary? The angel of the Lord appeared unto me, and angel Gabriel told me that the Spirit of God will come upon me, and I will have a child. And, and, and that child will be the son of God. Clearly, whatever she told Joseph just wasn't working. He didn't want to be a part of this baby daddy drama situation. Verse 19 says he thought to break up privately. Joseph was ready to reject Mary and her child, her baby Jesus. He didn't want to have to raise another man's baby. This must have been a bittersweet moment uh -huh, for Mary. I don't think she really knew how to handle it. I mean, how do you tell somebody, I'm pregnant, but I'm still a virgin? That's some kind of baby daddy drama there that I can, like I've never heard of before. And clearly, Joseph just wasn't buying it. He planned to break the engagement and put her away privately. But in that very moment, an angel appears telling Mary's exact same story. Verse 20, Joseph, don't be afraid to marry Mary. Yes, she's pregnant, but it's not your baby. It's the child of the Holy Ghost. Oh, I've read this story uh, hundreds of times, but I read it again this past week, and I ask the question, why should Jesus choose to be born into baby daddy drama? Why subject the pure and holy baby Jesus to such shame and embarrassment? Why must the legacy of Christ's childhood be tainted with this humiliation and ignominy? A mother who's pregnant gets pregnant by the Holy Ghost tells this tale, Joseph, it's not your baby, and an angel telling her exact same story, Joseph, it's not your baby. Oh, I wrestled with this passage all week long until finally it sat up and smiled in my face. Oh yes, the scripture does do that sometimes. And for the first time, I understood this baby daddy drama in a brand new way. You see, Jesus comes to a world filled with pride and ego. Everybody used pride and ego to cover up their shame and disgrace. So in this world where everybody wants to take credit, all humanity wants to stake their claims to goodness. Every heart wishes to embrace the, uh, the accolades and accept the congratulations of human accomplishments. 
Massachusetts, a world with people far removed from God's spirit, men and women driven to look good, be right, and win, everybody devoid of surrender, humility, and selflessness, and instead filled with pomposity, arrogance, and pride, they cried collectively, God, we don't need your salvation. We can produce our own. We can save ourselves by ourselves. We can fix ourselves by ourselves, regardless of culture, language, race, or creed. Every human being lived infected with the disease of self-righteousness. Everybody looking out for number one and seeking to prove their worth and validate themselves by their own good works. They tried to save themselves by themselves and without God, but God has always been looking for somebody to tell this message that God and God alone can produce salvation. No human being can generate salvation. Nobody can claim salvation as their own production. But even God's most faithful followers, the Jewish people, the leaders of the community kept messing this up. Everybody God tried to get to tell this truth failed miserably. He tried Noah, but Noah couldn't do it because he got saturated with pleasure and got drunk, drunk on the eve of reconstruction, drunk when he should have been sober. He tried Abraham, but he couldn't do it because he tried to produce God's promised son himself without God when he lay down and slept with Hagar. He tried Jacob, but he couldn't do it because he played too many tricks and lied to steal the birthright. A trickster caught up in his own way. He tried Moses but he couldn't do it because he hit the rock when he should have spoken to the rock he put himself and ignorance and arrogance on the throne instead of surrendering to the Spirit of God he tried David but David couldn't do it because he slept with Bathsheba and then killed Uriah to cover it up he tried Solomon but he couldn't do it because he had way too many wives and too many concubines he tried Samson but he couldn't do it because he lost his hair when he got his head caught up in Delilah's lap. He tried Jeremiah, but Jeremiah couldn't do it because he, he just cried too much. We know him as the weeping prophet. He tried Daniel, but he couldn't do it because he was too apocalyptic and too hard to understand. He tried the entire Jewish nation, but they couldn't do it because they got drunk on legalistic self-righteousness. Finally, God says, if I can't find anybody who will go tell this message, the truth about salvation, I'll just go my Myself. And so God locked himself up in Mary's belly and sent an angel with this simple, edgy, uh, but politically incorrect message, this theological plain talk in a dream. Joseph, 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 wakey, wakey. Don't be afraid to take Mary, protect her, and provide for her and her child, but don't take the credit. Don't embrace the congratulations. Don't accept the accolades because this baby, this child is not your baby. It's the child of the Holy Ghost. And that's all I came to say to you this day. This Christmas story teaches us that salvation comes from God and God alone. And it's not your baby. The gospel story is not your baby. Redemption is not our own creation. It's not something we produce. Just maybe I can press my claim a little bit further because the shame of Mary's story speaks volumes here. The writer doesn't want us to miss the significance. See, Matthew's gospel opens with Jesus' genealogy. He intentionally chase, traces the ancestry of Jesus back to Abraham. He includes illustrious men of the Jewish community, of the Jew, men that the Jewish people admired and revered and loved and respected, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. If you just read Matthew chapter 1, ah, but then this writer does something so unusual in a world that typically excluded women from genealogy, genealogies. This writer includes four women, but these four women all had spotty, 
shameful reputations. Look at the text. He includes Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. And I suspect that nobody felt proud to be the descendants of these four women. They had bad reputations and stories of brokenness, outright sin, public shame. Tamar pretended to be a prostitute. Rahab was a prostitute. Ruth was sexually forward with Boaz. Bathsheba committed adultery with King David. All these women bore the scarlet letter of shame and disgrace. But then he adds a fifth woman. Her name is Mary. Mary gets pregnant out of wedlock and must forever tell this spurious story of an immaculate conception all her life. No doubt she would face daily ridicule, scorn, and shame. Here the writer shouts the gospel message, regardless of your brokenness and shame, God comes to you. God will ungod himself, choose an ignoble heritage, and take on human shame and brokenness and sin and embarrassment. The prophet Isaiah said it, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And today he comes to all humanity hiding from sin shame everybody like adam uh, hiding in the bushes hiding covering themselves up with fig leaves of shame hiding from an angry world and a searching god everybody broken and battered and beaten and bruised are trying to cover it up you know human beings by nature are inauthentic creatures and we fix our inauthenticity we satisfy the the itch of our inauthenticity by seeking to look good to be right and to win in order to hide, protect, defend, avoid anybody knowing that deep down on the inside we are broken, battered, beaten, and bruised, and I'm not enough, and there's something wrong with me, and I'm all alone here in the world, but I stopped by to tell somebody this morning that God took all of that, the woof and hoof of human brokenness, and bundled it up and said, hey, I will still come to this earth in the form of a baby. I will take on the shame. I will embrace the embarrassment. I will accept the ridicule. I will acknowledge the scorn. I won't run from it. He says, I'm not going to hide from it. He said, I will accept it and lead broken humanity out of darkness, out of shame, out of ridicule, out of anger, out of all the brokenness and embarrassment of missing the mark when trying to do good and lead us to redemption and salvation. This is the gospel story. You can't save yourself by yourself. You can't manufacture your own righteousness. You can't make your own goodness to cover up your shame. Salvation is not your baby. You can't lay claim to it by the works of the law. You can't take credit for it and give it your name. You can't accept the accolades and embrace the congratulations because it's not your baby. It's the child of the Holy Ghost. The angel's simple message to Joseph, you must name him Jesus. Jesus means Yahweh is salvation and God saves for he shall save his people from their sins. You see, the difference between all other babies and this baby Jesus all other babies need salvation. My babies need it and your babies need it. Oh, but Jesus, oh my Jesus, he is salvation. Yeshua means Yahweh is salvation. God saves. He saves from the guttermost to the uttermost. He saves from fear, guilt, and shame. He saves from pomposity, from arrogance, and from pride. Jesus, God's gift to a fallen world. I speak this message for somebody here today. Won't you accept Jesus as your salvation? Won't you accept him as God's greatest gift? Not just here at Christmas time, but every time, every day, for we don't have to wait for Christmas. We don't have to wait for Christmas to celebrate Jesus. Amen. 
Whenever God gives you Jesus, it's Christmas morning. And I go throughout the entire year just thankful that just for today I could give up looking good. I could give up being right. I could give up my drive to win at everything I do and, 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 and pretend to be better than everybody else. Why? Because I'm settled. I'm rooted, I'm anchored in the awesome reality that God has come to me and he's taken me, he's accepted my brokenness. I no longer have to perpetrate. I don't have to pretend any longer. I don't have to look good for anybody else. I don't have to live a lie. I don't have to claim it. I don't have to name it. I don't have to try to produce my own good works, try to manufacture my own righteousness. I don't need to impress anybody. I can be authentically me. I can be who I really am in Christ Jesus. I can smile at the world. I can love everybody. I can hold everybody in my arms and say, hey, I love you. I love you because God has changed my heart. He's brought me out from this dark place where I was hiding in shame, too afraid to stand up and be counted in the world, too afraid to let my voice be heard, too afraid to speak my message, to sing my song, to tell my story, to write my poetry, too afraid to leave a, leave a legacy because I was fixated on what they thought of me. I can live a life of power make a vital contribution wherever I go because of Jesus Christ. I invite somebody here today. If you want to just accept Jesus and say, Lord Jesus, I, I invite you into my life to come and do for me, for my brokenness and my shame, what you've promised to to do, to take my shame, to take my anger, to take my hurt, to take my emptiness, to take my sickness, to take my weakness and transform it. I invite you right now, I just want to pray for you. Would you stand with me wherever you are right here in the church? Would you just stand with me? I want to pray for you. Gracious God, we just thank you for your love. Oh God, I thank you for the power of the gospel that shines with a luminescent glory in the face of all our humanity where we all have tried to take credit. We've all tried to produce our own good works. We've all tried to manufacture our own righteousness. We've all tried to lay claim to goodness and declare that we don't need God's salvation because we can make our own. But we've discovered, oh God, that that pathway only leads to brokenness, weakness, sickness, emptiness, and shame. And all of us, like Adam, have been hiding in the bushes, scared of an angry world and a searching God. But today, this message of Jesus coming in the midst of our shame, embracing our shame, choosing a legacy, a heritage of human shame to be born into. This message rings in our hearts that the God of the universe would choose to live in our hearts, to be a part of our lives, not for us to transform him, but for God to transform us. Lord, today I just pray for somebody here today, right now, in this great community of faith, oh God, we stand in your presence acknowledging that salvation is not our baby. We don't produce it. We don't manufacture it. All we could do is surrender to this baby Jesus, who's born afresh and anew, not in Bethlehem, but in our hearts. He's able to transform us. He's able to renew us, revitalize us, rejuvenate us, and restore us. And oh God, today I thank you for Jesus. May we surrender to his love and peace. In his holy name I pray, amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing that great song. What child is this? Thank you.
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. May the Lord shine a face of love upon you and give you peace. And you're rising up and in your setting down. And you're going out and you're coming in. In your laughter and in your sorrow. In your labor and in your leisure. Until you come to the place where there's no more sunset and no dawning. Amen. God bless. Be seated.